you know, that's what you guys always tell me to do when you're recording something. Just do the clap, sync the audio. I mean, now that we're recording, I can. The story before the story is is that Garrett's the only writer that's ever saved my ass in an interview because we were doing all this stuff down at Josh Hayes's house for the J Force training, and I brought everything except good lights. Hey, you forgot the lights, man. The most important part. Yeah. And Garrett's like, hey, man, I'm just, you know, I'm living out of the van. I got some stuff. What do you think of this? And he's got all these lights and stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah, shit, I need that, man. Let's Dude, bring I, it in. <laughs> I love making videos and stuff. I like the idea of it. And I, I feel like I can do it. It's just I just need the right approach and content and, like, just ideas and stuff. So, I mean, if you guys got any ideas, let's just say, my way. You like yeah. videos in your van. Okay, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. No, I just like making videos in general. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to boost the Garrett Gerloff brand. So, I got clarity. You. just wanted clarity. Okay, I'm yeah. right off the bat. Congratulations. Uh, you know, yeah, no shit, buddy. Good solid team, and uh, I got to say that first and foremost. So, so how is it running with the GRT Yamaha team? Man, it's been awesome. Honestly, I, it's you never know because like um, there's all the people say stuff and. Like one of the things that I had heard is that the Italian teams are the, the worst ones, the hardest ones to get along with. Um, um, and I, I think that was about I think that was about it. But just just <laughs> that they're, they're hard to get along with. They have the strong opinions and stuff, and and they do things their way, and, and it's their way or the highway. But so that's kind of like just I didn't know what to expect. That's just how I went into the the meeting the team and everything, just kind of thinking that it might go that way. But man, being with them for the last three months, seriously, like. Besides these guys right here, uh, it's it's for sure the best team that I've ever been with. They're, they're so cool. Like it's like it feels just a total family vibe. Um, we have dinner every night uh, together. Like when we're uh, when we're testing or when we were in Australia. In Australia, actually, we we had two houses um, by the coast that the team rented out, and so it was uh, the whole team was living between those two houses. And so I had my team had one house, and and Federico's team had the other house. And no, it was a really it was like a really cool cool thing that you just don't see too much in the u.s but it uh it really makes that team bond strong and i mean for me it, it was uh it's just really nice to you get to know everybody a lot more and you get to see the passion that everybody has for racing and it just really like gets you motivated to go out there and give it everything you have uh for for yourself and for, for the guys on the teams so uh, no it's been an awesome experience was it the first time you met these guys was that in um was it was it MagniCore? Did you go over there for that? Was that was that the first time you were kind of starting to make the move, or when did you first meet your team? Yeah, the first time I, I really met the team was actually uh, for the first test. Um, I mean, I had kind of met some of the guys at MagniCore, um, but that's a kind of a it's a crazy story because I I didn't go to MagniCore expecting to uh, ever talk to the GRT team. I, I didn't even think that was going to be um, an option. Um, I really went to MagniCore just to go over there and just say hi just 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 talk to people and um you know at yamaha usa had kind of let the yamaha europe guys know that i was interested and um and so they were they, they just let me come over there and, and hang out with those guys and and i mean i was i was wanting to to have an opportunity to get a shot to go over there and so i was kind of you know talking about that you know a decent amount and and I don't even know what happened in 72 hours, but it kind of went from looking like nothing's going to happen to there's a spot open and, and you, your name's on it to getting a contract and, and signing it and, and just bam, bam, bam. Like that, like I, I didn't, when I first got to Magni Corps after the first day or two, I was like, I was like, man, this is not a waste of time, but this is, this is just isn't going to happen. You know, it, it's, uh, I'm giving it everything I have. I'm showing my face. I came here. I'm, I'm enjoying it, but I'm not going to leave with anything. And then to, to, to have a totally 180 flip and to, to leave with a, a ride on, on the caliber of team that those guys are and, and with the close connection they have to, to Yamaha Europe, I mean, I was, I was blown away and, uh, and still just super thankful. And, and man, I just, I just want to I'm, – I'm dying here at home. To like, you know, I, I don't want to be <laughs> out. So I want to be out there in the world, like, trying to, trying to you know – uh, yeah, I do the best I can for for those guys and for me, and that's killing me to be here. <laughs> yeah, is, bad, this, man. is this your first time looking overseas? Uh, I mean, literally your first attempt, and right off the bat. Well, you... I, I mean, like I had, I've been to, I've gone to Europe quite a few times. Like I, I've been over there um, to watch MotoGP races, to, to uh, mainly MotoGP races, but I, I've been to quite a few times. I actually went with my ex girlfriend a few times um, to Spain, and so I, I, I kind of had 
a year old bug, like wanting to go over there pretty bad, but actually going and trying to find something to, for the, for the, you know, the upcoming year, that was the first time I actually went into it like that and with the, with that intention. Um, and paid off somehow. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. So, so I mean, I, I, I'm going to go back to this little snippet. You said ex-girlfriend. So I'm assuming you're single and ready to mingle. Is that is that what the word is? I mean, just just straight into the the love life questions, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's Nitto. It's Nitto. He wants to no, get there. No, 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 freaking Nitto. Yeah, no, I am single. So and uh, I have no complaints so far. <laughs> now, now here's the thing, Corey. Humor me, and you can relate. Oh. To be young. And single and travel the world. God bless them. You know that's my hat goes off to him again. No, you can't. I can't, I can't relate at all, man. I got married at like twenty three, had a kid at twenty five, and <laughs> I got an eighteen year old now. So, man, that's See, just he said, <laughs> "I'm sorry, Garrett. I'm sorry. He's hating on you. I'm, I'm, I'm a. I, I'm a I am living vicariously I'm through young. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's like you know all great and everything, but I mean, I couldn't cut my hair like this. I couldn't have a. a full, <laughs> I couldn't have a full on bullet right now if I had a girlfriend. So I mean, there's uh, awesome perks. I don't know. I don't know if you can say that. Never know. You <laughs> never know. But 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 that that is quite the do. That is quite. The, now, I, I know this has been kind of the butt of jokes for the past couple of weeks, but, you know. That side. But I'm, but I'm stuck inside. You know, I, I don't have to go out and yeah. about. But, but Garrett, that, that is quite the mullet. That is quite the hairdo. Well, this happened because my hair was looking crazy for, for a while because all the barbershops are closed and stuff. So, and I mean, I'm not going to take a chance and cut my own hair. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give it to my friends to see what they yeah. can come up with. <laughs> Uh, and they came up with the with the mullet, and I mean, I gotta give a shout out to to Jake Lewis because he's the the innovator. He's the one oh that made goodness. full <laughs> year, full year long. Was what was it like eighteen or something? Oh, uh -huh. so bad with the mullet, and uh, and he grew it out. He it was a true Kentucky waterfall from a Kentuckian. So I mean, you know, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. <laughs> that, that, was, that, that was magic. He did. Uh, he did do it justice. I gotta say that that hairstyle. Alone. I'm gonna have to cut it, you know, before I go back to to race. But I'm I'm gonna try to get it growing out. And you don't want to have you're gonna have those locks flowing out of the back of your helmet. <laughs> that, that's the, that would be the that would be the goal. My team probably into about it. <laughs> you could go the other well, way. See, I'll show it to him. I'm gonna show it to him, and then if they, if you know, because the photos don't do it justice. So if they if they see it outside of the if they see me in person and then they, they like take a look around, they might be like, might have to go visit this Kentucky place and <laughs> these people are about. They might they might they might put their opinion. <laughs> now talking about you know everything being shut down, no barbershops, no nothing. How's it like being quarantined down in Texas? Uh, you're you're in the Houston area, is that correct? Yeah, in Houston. Uh, I've been been back for uh, a few months now. Uh, honestly, I can't remember exactly when I came back, but it, whatever day. Uh, Trump announced that the, the borders were going to be 13 down or at least like a lot more restrictions to, for travel and stuff. That's when, uh, I mean, I didn't really know anything about it because I, I wasn't really keeping up with the news too much, uh, over in Spain. And so, uh, it, my mom ended up calling me like 20 times because when, when, uh, when he made that, that speech from the oval office, it was like 6 PM here or something like that. And it was two in the morning in Spain. And so my mom kind of got all freaked out. And I guess, like, by this time, uh, the, uh, Qatar had already been canceled or postponed, and so had the next race after that, Jerez or something like that. So, like, I knew I had a month at least. So, uh, so she's calling me 20 times. It's 2 in the morning. I finally – my phone's on vibrate. I finally hear the thing vibrating, and uh, I see I got 20 calls from my mom, and I'm like, great. Like, all right, what, what is it? You know, what's going on? <laughs> and uh, she calls me saying, like, I should probably get a flight home uh, before everything gets kind of crazy because – you know, obviously, if if the president says that the borders are going to be closing, then every American around the world is going to want to come back more or less at the around the same time. So, I bought a flight at. She called me at two in the morning. I bought a flight at three in the morning uh, to come home. It was not cheap, like the news people were saying that flights would be cheap. Uh, of course. And, yeah, yeah, and uh, and and so I, uh, yeah, I. Uh, she called me at two, bought the flight at three, and I was on the plane at six in the morning. So it was like bam, bam, bam. I had to, I had That's to. Tight. Yeah, no, it was tight for sure because I, I live an hour away from the Barcelona airport too. So I had an hour to get there. Uh, I had to be there two hours ahead. So literally, like I was scrambling, trying to buy the flight, trying to pack uh, a small suitcase with everything I thought I would need 
And uh, did you and, have to leave things back? You know, did you have to leave yeah, stuff no, behind? I have a ton or? of stuff. I have a, I still have a ton of stuff in Spain. I mean, I I'm li I'm running on limited clothes and stuff right now. <laughs> I mean, I have enough because I had some stuff here, but uh, no, I mean, I I got. I got uh, you know a 450 over there. I got a scooter over there. My I have a van that I bought. Like I have a Euro van. I love that oh, thing. Thanks. I miss it. <laughs> uh, and you know I'm still you know paying rent and stuff over there. So the more time I spend here, I'm like I'm not using all the stuff that I have over there. Like I, I need to go utilize it. So I'm not just burning money. <laughs> now did you, did you uh, feel a little kind of like freaked out that you had to run to an airport and? Did you have protection, a mask, or anything? Did you even think about, consider that, like, oh yeah. wow, I might be getting sick, like literally trying to get the heck out of, uh, you know, get the heck out of Dodge? Yeah, I mean, I was a little bit concerned about it because that, that things at that point seemed like they were getting pretty serious. So I, I all I had was a, uh, I don't know what they, I don't know what they're called, but they're, it's, they call them in Spain a boof, a boof, which is like a, it's like what you wear when you're in, when it's when it's really cold. It covers your neck. You can pull it up. It covers. Yeah, your, yeah, like the bottom. Yeah, I, was wearing, the I was wearing one of those in the airport. And luckily, I brought it with me because, like, I didn't want to leave my my Euro van at the airport because it's like eight euros a day or something, and I didn't oh. know how long I was going to be away. Good, and like I said, I had like forty five minutes to buy the flight, uh, pack the bag, and leave. And I tried to call uh, one of my friends that I had in Spain to see if he could take me, but no answer. And I'm like, well, I'm not driving my van, and I'm not getting a taxi because that's crazy. So. I I put my suitcase on my scooter. It's a little 125 Yamaha in Max or something like that. And uh, I put the the suitcase on the scooter. It's it's 35 degrees outside. It's freezing, it's freezing wow. cold. I have a jacket on, a long sleeve shirt, a t-shirt on. I got just a pair of sweatpants, which I what, did not do anything really. Uh, one pair of socks on, normal pair of shoes. I got some some like gloves that are that are kind of warm but they're made for like 40 degree weather 50 degree weather and not going 70 miles an hour uh so i froze for an hour i mean it was the, it was the most miserable hour of my life uh wow. completely frozen i couldn't feel my toes for an hour, like two hours in the airport walking around uh <laughs> it, it was rough but um but yeah so i you know the scooter came in handy though because it's free airport parking so the, the, oh, since, no. I, since I've been here, my scooter has been in the Barcelona parking lot for two months now. So, I mean, I, oh, fingers no. crossed that when I get back, <laughs> the battery isn't completely dead, the thing starts, and I can get home. Otherwise, you know, I, I need to think ahead and bring a battery with me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Man, so, so are you, what are you hearing about your season so far? I know, you know, they keep pushing the calendar, and they're still trying to, do, you know, get yeah. some races in. What are you, what are you hearing? Dude, on, I've have no definitive answer. I have no idea. I, I mean, I hear rumors from these people. I hear some things that might be a little more official from these people, but they, but even the people that might be in the know more are conflicting with what they say. So I, I my whole life is in limbo right now and it's, it's eating me up on the inside. I need like, I mean, the schedule is nice to have because it like, at least me, it gives me like a, like a, an aim, a goal, you know, to get ready right. for the next right. race, the next events, whatever. But right now, uh, I, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> in my life. I'm just, I'm trying to train still and everything. But, uh, you know, they keep making announcements like, oh, hey, might go racing here at this time, uh, you know, be ready. And then like, oh, no, that gets postponed and canceled. And, and we're going to do that later in the year. And and uh, it's not good for me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> have, you, have you had any seat time before? I mean, after your uh, your, your World Superbike uh, debut, did you get on the bike afterwards, like get some confidence back up, get a little bit more rhythm in your system? After Australia? Yeah. Yeah. No, I. That's the last time I was on a bike was uh, uh, Sunday morning warm up before I got taken out. So, not the best note to leave it on, but I yeah, mean, no I, I still felt really good. Like I, I felt. Uh, I was just so disappointed because in, in race one, I learned so much about just the tires and, and how the races kind of work. And I mean, it is kind of different because Australia is kind of like uh, their Daytona a little bit. They use different tires, harder compounds. Uh, the track's pretty abrasive, so they, they have to uh, bring different stuff there. So it's um, it reminded me a lot of Daytona and kind of how you have to ride there. Um, but I just didn't, didn't do it right, really, in the first race. So I was really excited to get into uh, the Super Bowl race and the second race to kind of see if what I thought I had learned was actually something that I could use. Um, but then, yeah, I, you know, getting knocked out and 
you know, they have the rule that you know, you lose consciousness and you're you're kind of done for the weekend. So that was uh, something else I learned. Well, <laughs> so I'm gonna try to not do that again. The one thing I don't like to talk a whole lot about business. I'd rather talk about other fun stuff. But yeah. have you heard anything about for you for next year? Because I know now, like in the MotoGP paddock, like Suzuki's gone ahead and frozen everybody's yeah. contract until 2022. You know, part of being the first run of a season and especially in something like world Superbike, with your teammate already familiar with the track already familiar with the team structure because he came from their 600 program i think right is that is that correct uh, yeah a different team but you know it's from yamaha yeah right so from the yamaha family there are have you heard anything about your contract for next year are you guys frozen until 2022 or are you still gotta make do with what you got and then we'll see at the end of the year yeah, I gotta, I gotta make do with what I have right now. Um, I haven't heard anything. I mean, obviously, I've been trying to, uh, you know, through my managers, kind of see what what their plans are and things. Um, but only doing one out of thirty nine races, I, I would hope that maybe I would have, uh, you know, another year to to try to work things out. But it's just nobody knows what's happening right now. Nobody knows if we're still gonna have seven, eight races, um, you know, until like December. That's something I've heard. So, uh, so I think it's kind of it's kind of too early maybe to, to, to be trying to, they haven't, they haven't officially ended this season yet. So right. I think that's where everybody's held up. If they end the season, then I would, I would hope that, that I would have a, a renewed contract for next year, the same, you know, same deal that I had this year. Um, and then, and then kind of start, start from zero. Um, um, well, no offense. We don't want you back here, man. We need you <laughs> over there. We need you over there flying the flag and doing all that, that you do over there. So, I don't, Appreciate it, man. I don't want you back. I, <laughs> I, I miss it over there. I really do enjoy being over there. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I when I was there, I missed my, you know, my 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 family, my friends, and stuff. But no, it's uh, I, I got a really cool group of friends over there, and a lot of other riders that I've been training with, and I felt like I was learning so much. So I I just hate to I hate that I had to give that up, you know, for the last few months. But um, but yeah, it is what it is. So can't change anything. Now, do you get to catch up on time with your family? I mean, uh, are they in in reach, or is everybody kind of parted ways? Uh, you know, what's what's going on at home? Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I, I live forty minutes from uh, from my mom and dad, and my brother lives with me actually. So, I mean, we've been yeah, like kind of normal. Our, our thing is to have Sunday together, uh, you know, have a little fun day. So, we've been doing that for the last uh, few weeks, and I'm kind of sick of them again. So, it's time to go. <laughs> 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 now how, how's your training been i mean have you been able to train uh have you been training more what do you have access to what, what's going on uh with with keeping that momentum going i've been doing, trying to do everything i can um but you know i got uh i only have one dirt bike right now here and i might have went over the bars on it uh a month ago <laughs> or so and so uh i i have olin's forks and, and and a shock on there and they work really really well but i when i went over the bars, uh, somehow the bike hit so hard that the fork seals uh, totally just blew out at the bottom and all the oil came out. <laughs> uh, and, so it was a, you know, I, I don't know how the bike hit that hard. But um, anyway. Were you, were you watching <laughs> anything Nitro Circus related? What in the hell were you thinking? <laughs> no, I just, the, the, the takeoff was just kind of soft and you know, <laughs> <laughs> on the face of it, it's the second half of the day. It's always the, the first couple laps of the day that just totally gets you. And so it got me. I, yeah, soft, soft space basically of uh, – it was actually in like this makeshift whoop section that wasn't a whoop section. It was like a double, double, double section. And I just doubled the first one and went into the second uh, little dip right there. And they had just watered it really really they had watered it a lot and the first lap i went around i noticed it was a little bit like a little bit deep but not as deep as where i hit the second lap because i went to the bottom and just completely like stopped almost and lost all my momentum and it just threw me forward off that second one and and uh went into win so but destroyed my my fork seals and so i've been waiting for for the last month to get fork seals from olin's but because of all the the pandemic stuff and you know people aren't shipping things out people aren't at work so uh it's really kind of put a damper on my my motor motocross training so uh, i've just been stepping it up with a bicycle doing some uh like kind of body weight uh what do they call it um like body weight style circuit stuff mm -hmm. like crossfit but not crossfit i've been doing that a lot running um but i'm definitely ready to ride again um 
but but at the same time like i think the, the motocross track that i normally ride ride at it's been closed for the last three weeks anyway so i i really haven't missed out a whole lot um but yeah just not having a motorcycle in my life is killing me <laughs> <laughs> well i can tell you this i mean we go back before we started recording you know we talked about you know being with josh hayes and doing his j force camp and brian i can tell you watching watching garrett try to do stick and ball sports <laughs> and try to wrap his head around the concept of you know tennis uh, specifically was bar none one of the best experiences of my life watching it because he's so competitive he's a hyper competitive guy and he wants to win at everything and not being able to do a basic thing just drives him nuts so i can imagine sitting in a room right now knowing i can't go out and i can't do anything i need to go do is gotta just be wrecking you well let's i mean hold on a second he he was playing tennis against josh hayes does he did he, no. did he know what he was up against or no well it wasn't really like you know like a tennis match it was just learn fundamental skills and you know some ball ball handling uh drills and things like that and he uh, there was a tennis pro i forget whoever was down there and they were just trying to serve up some things and bobby was getting ultra competitive <laughs> and then garrett was just and you're just sitting there going this is amazing <laughs> <laughs> Look, so I, I just didn't want to embarrass the tennis pro out there so i just dropped, dropped the level down before <laughs> always a gentleman. Always a gentleman. That, that's, that's good I thought you were going to say, Corey, I thought you were going to say that you were impressed with my skills, but apparently no. It's that this dude, is how bad it was. <laughs> dude, when, when, it, when it came to sliding the bike around and going to the supermoto track, oh, yeah, hands down, bar none impressed. <laughs> Watching you play tennis, I'm like, I could take him. I got him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I do. I hate it. I, I hate not being good at something. And, and I mean, it's good to, to not be good at something and learn how to do it right. I understand where Josh is coming from, but it is not fun. It is not fun to suck. So, <laughs> well, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know you. I think your brother's into like cars and customizing. Are you into cars? Do you got any special kind of cars laying around? Are you into that or? Yeah, I, I, it's not that I. I do like cars a lot, but honestly, what I enjoy more is is um, kind of redoing stuff or modifying stuff. Like that's that's where I really enjoy. Uh, that, that's that's like one of my, one of the hobbies of mine. And so uh, my brother's the same way. I, he spends a ton of money on on redoing the cars he has. But um, no, I think uh, right now I just have a I just have a van, like I just have a, a moto van, and that's it. So I, I have done some stuff to it. I actually, funny story, I it's a, it's a Mercedes van, and there's a company that's like a mile away from a mile away from where I live that I had no idea existed. They reached out to me when they saw that I had got the van, and they were like, "Hey, it would be awesome if we could, you know, help you build it out if you ever want to do that." And uh, and I had been looking before I committed to buying the the van. I was like, man, where am I gonna, where am I gonna get a wall put in it and and uh, you know bed and stuff like that? And they reached out to me, and it was like just the the perfect situation and a mile away. So I just like rode it, uh, drove drove the van there, and then just rode my bicycle back home <laughs> and uh, nice. and then you get the inside of it and everything. So, um, but that that wasn't me redoing anything. But I I do really enjoy uh, just learning how to do something new and modifying stuff uh that's that's cool it's like it's like you're leaving your mark you're leaving your mark on something in the world uh and, and i like that kind of creating something that that i don't i don't know how to explain it. but anyway i think you have <laughs> no it's a, i, I can you. relate to that but yes i've also sunk a lot of money into vehicles that i currently don't own so that's uh yes <laughs> i i like throwing my money the land the road, was it a range rover something like that range rover's gone land rover's gone i've got a volkswagen <laughs> yeah. that's it family guy. i am the family guy right now all the yeah. toys are gone yeah yeah got some motorcycles but that's it yeah you know that's it it's a it's a slow death let me tell you enjoy it while you got it <laughs> yeah uh I, speaking of like doing stuff and modifying stuff and whatever did you guys see the the facebook post i put up of me doing tile tile flooring and stuff no. yes yes no, i didn't see it yeah i i actually have that that I was quite impressed. It was in you and uh, Nick McFadden working yeah, on that? Yeah, Nick McFadden and I, we, he was, I mean, I, I don't know if he's going to be racing this year. So we kind of decided to, to switch gears and he's doing like some house flipping stuff. And uh, like I said, I've been going crazy the last two months. So I've been just trying to do something to occupy myself. And one of those things is just learning to do new things. And so uh, I've actually been working with uh, uh, my brother's girlfriend's dad down here a little bit. He's got a rental house that he's been 
redoing and one of the things he was redoing was the floor the tile floor and so i was working a little bit on that uh figuring out how to you know lay tile and do the mortar and everything like that and uh and so nick saw that i was that i was helping with him and he was like hey i need tiles floors done too like you want to come up here and and uh and help me out and i was like yeah sure so i went up there to kentucky and we spent like a few days doing uh this kitchen floor bathroom two bathroom floors and two showers so uh and i mean i was i don't know how long it's gonna last like i i told him i was like i can't guarantee my work but <laughs> but uh but you know i'm cheap so uh so so he was happy he's been happy so far it's held up and you know we'll see come come back in five years and we'll see if, it, if it's still like that but that's but, the kind yeah. of shoddy craftsmanship i could use man so if you need to come back out to california <laughs> I got a I got a kitchen and some bathrooms that you know. All you right, know, all right. Well, you know, we'll message later and we'll get the pricing sorted out. But I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm out of work right now, so. Yeah, if this World Superbike gig doesn't work out, just come on down. Yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> and, and how have you been uh, contacting anybody over in Europe for years, or was this your first attempt? And the two-parter is that. How hard is it to secure a team here in the United States? Like, what's the comparison? Is it easier to possibly navigate overseas, uh, get different brands and sponsorships, or is it harder to get a contract here in the United States with, with, with road racing? Honestly, there's no secret. It's if you get the results, then you'll have opportunities come your way. And like 2018, I, I had a really tough year. Uh, I had a lot of bad luck that was associated with that. And um, I mean, I, I wasn't getting any I didn't even want to approach anybody because I, I didn't I didn't even perform how I thought I could perform and I wasn't getting any results. So why approach anybody that, it, you know, it just didn't make sense. So, you know, the next year uh, when I finally started, I mean, I was on the podium all year long in 2019, but I still wasn't winning races. And you got to you got to win if, if you want to if you want to uh, get, get a reason, if you want to get an opportunity, you got to win stuff. So um, when I finally was able to, to win a couple, that was when um, and, and like the, the superbike class is, is super tough. I mean, Tony, Cameron, Schultz, Heron, uh, Bob, well, not Bob, Bobby, that, that wasn't last year. But anyway, there's a, there's a lot of guys that are just at a super high level and it's not an easy class at all. And so, um, you know, I, I was pumped to finally, to finally win a couple. And I, I think the rest of the world also knows that those guys are no jokes. Um, and so that was when I was, that's when I felt more comfortable approaching people was was because i had something to back up my name a little bit and so i, I think that's just the way people have to go about it it's like if if you don't have the results then then just keep working on getting the results and then once you start getting results that's when opportunities should should happen um and and that would be probably the the best advice i could give um i mean sure there's something there's something to do with knowing the right people but honestly i haven't known the right people for most of my career it's just I've just try to put my head down and and do the best I can, and and that's got me farther than than a lot uh, of other other stuff. So, um, but as far as as far as it being easier to get a, a ride in the U.S., I mean, I think it's difficult to get a get a you know a, ro a ride where they're paying you to race. That's that's kind of I mean that's kind of difficult in any sport, honestly. <clears throat> I mean, if you're I mean, if you want to be a football player and get paid, if you want to be a baseball player and get paid, motocross racer and get paid, tennis player and get paid. I mean, if you want to do any sport and get paid, I mean, you got to be at the top, you got to be close to the top because the rest of the guys, they're, you know, they're trying to get to the, those top spots where they're getting sponsorship money and, and stuff. So, I mean, it's, I think it's the same across any sport, really. You just got to be in, in that top, you know, 5%. And, uh, and then if you can do that, then, then it might, it can become a career, but yeah, it's focused on getting the results. Let me ask you this. All right. Between us gentlemen here. You know, I know we go back, I uh, did a lot of, uh, you know, you did a lot of improving with your career with Yamaha. Uh, what was like the, the age or when was it where you wanted to express an interest to maybe do something wild card overseas? And was that thought it embraced? Uh, did, did the powers that be kind of accept that or kind of push back? No, I mean, I've always been interested in racing in the world championship. I mean, it's, it's like the Olympics. It's just where all the whole world comes together to see who's the best. And there's like all that, you know, national pride associated with it and, and just being, being, being considered the best in the world. I mean, that, that allure is, is, is awesome. So, I mean, since the beginning, I've always wanted to do that. 
And I remember watching, you know, racing back in the day and seeing Nikki Hayden, Ben Spees, Colin Edwards, you know, these American guys going over and, and, you know, conquering the world more or less like that. That was such a, that was such, that was so cool to see because it kind of, you know, I was just a kid and I wasn't even really racing at that point, but just to see somebody else do it, I was like, I mean, if they can do it, maybe, maybe I can do it too. So that, that was, uh, that was really cool. And I guess it kind of, in a way, that's kind of what I want to do too, is, is just, um, kind of inspire anybody else to, uh, to, you know, get into race and take the risk, like try to, try to, because if I wouldn't have had Ben and, and Colin and those guys to inspire me, like maybe I wouldn't even be on this path right now. So I'd be cool if I was able to do the same to, to those kids. But honestly, I forgot the question. What was the question? <laughs> no, but, but Corey, Corey, do you see a theme here? Except for Nikki, it's all Texas. I mean, that's where yeah. all the talent is in Texas. It's, it's definitely not any other part of the United States. It's Texas. Mm -hmm. California's produced a couple of decent ones from time to time. But yeah, I mean, you know, what you were saying, Garrett, is you were always the one person that was very upfront and vocal about wanting to be at that next level. You know, we would walk around the paddock and we'd try to talk to folks and say, you know, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to go World Superbike? And a lot of guys would just say, no, nah, there's too much pressure. Or, you know, I really like being in Moto America. I think we, we can do better here. But you were always just like, yeah, man, I, that next level is where I'm trying to be. And going back to what you said was, you know, 18 wasn't your year to go out and sell your wares, but 19 after Laguna, man, you just went on a tear. So, I mean, your stock went way up and that was the time to strike. So, you know, I applaud you for that. Do you feel any pressure now? You know, like I know Jake said he felt a little bit of pressure when he was over there, but now you're the one flying the colors. Do you feel any pressure? There's pressure, like I felt a ton of pressure here in the U.S. too. I mean, there's pressure with, with right. whatever. Um, I mean, I, I feel uh, maybe like a little bit more pressure just because I, I can see that the competition is, is at a, a really, really high level. And if there was one Cameron Bovier here and one Tony here, there's five of each of them, you know, in, <laughs> in, in World Superbike. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely like a, it's a tougher ladder to climb. Um, and so I, I just feel the pressure on myself because I, I know that I can do what those guys are doing. I just gotta, you know, put in the time and, and the work to to figure it out and 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 hopefully just take those little baby steps and climb the ladder. Um, and, but you know, it's hard. Like I said, I only got one one race out of thirty nine. Like I, I want some more chances because I the more I race, the more I'm gonna learn and the more that I'm gonna be able to put it all put all the pieces together and figure it out. But um, as far as like a lot more pressure because I'm American and one of the only ones over there. No, honestly, I don't, I don't really feel that kind of pressure. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, I mean, it's a little selfish in a way. I'm just doing this for me, and and I just want to see myself up at the, you know, that's the, on the podium at the top step. And right. and if I'm if I'm flying an American flag, that you know, that just makes it that much sweeter. But um, you know, I think the focus has to be a, a lot more uh, uh, focused on on me. If you, if you start focusing on too much, then then it just gets the picture just gets too big and 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 that's when you can get overwhelmed a little bit. So I just try to keep the focus on me and, and my goals. And, and then, you know, if I can keep completing those goals, then everybody else kind of rides the, the wave with me. So that's, that's yeah, that's what I'm doing. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned, Corey, earlier that, uh, you know, Josh Hayes' camp. Is, Garrett, is that what you're, you're, you got coaching? You got Josh coaching you uh, right now? Is that, is that uh, who's helping you with uh, a little bit of expertise? Yeah, that was a big thing last year was having Josh help me at the at the races and, and off the track too. I, I mean, obviously he's got a ton of experience, four-time AMA Superbike champion. Uh, he raced the same bike more or less that I was racing, so he had that direct connection with uh, with with me and kind of the struggles that maybe I had with the bike that you know that he experienced also. Like it was really nice to have somebody to just bounce ideas off of and to talk to and and be like, hey, you know, like I'm having struggling with this, like, and I think I'm gonna go down this road, and and he, he could be like yeah I, I know what you mean i've been down that road and i didn't get the, exactly the results that i wanted so maybe you should take this road i mean that was a that was a big help for sure um and all the, the work that we did at the j force camp too was awesome i mean me cameron peterson bobby uh, uh who else do we have Corey ventura uh hunter dunham i mean it was a it was a good group of guys and i still remember going out to to ride supermoto with them i think it was like apex car track and there was another one out in the middle of the desert somewhere uh, and we were just doing lap after lap after lap, try, you know, just battling it out with each other, uh, and, and just keeping it fun like that. But but really putting in work uh, it is the best, and it, it keeps it keeps you uh, keeps you on your toes, and it keeps you interested in what you're doing. And 
and you learn a lot that way. And that was something that uh, that really helped me because I, I kind of in some of that I was able to open my eyes up a little bit and kind of see more opportunities for for passing that I, I feel like I've been able to take through the, the the last part of 19 after the J Force camp and then also into what I'm doing now um, because like I couldn't even believe it either but like in the in the one race I did in Australia I was I was came from the back of the grid and was in was in seventh for you know the first half of the race and. Uh, but I was in the, I was in seventh uh, on the second lap, and I came from sixteenth. And I mean, really, a, a lot of the just the moves I was making on people was just from stuff I learned uh, with Josh and Cam and Bobby, just just racing with each other on the, these WR two fifties at these local car tracks. So um, yeah, it's it's man, it's it's crazy, but it's just all the little details that they have to come together to to make something happen. And and if you're missing just one detail, that's just one percent or more that 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 just makes it not all come together at the same time and and uh yeah but that yeah good times <laughs> <laughs> do you have something like that uh where you are in spain or is the team got something kind of set up uh you know for you over there do you have a coach or do you contact josh still or you know yeah no for sure yeah uh, that was yeah that's, uh, that's what i meant to say is that in australia josh actually came um mm -hmm. because he was uh he was racing the australian superbike championship mm -hmm. and so it was really nice to have that familiar face there in australia um, I mean, it, it is a little bit uh, tougher, at least it was, to to have him with me all the time, just because uh, flights to Europe aren't cheap, um, and you know, it's everything's just kind of expensive. Uh, and so, like, I, I still keep in, in touch with Josh, and I definitely want him to to help as much as I'm I'm able to, you know, financially uh, have him around. And uh, and yeah, so I hopefully if the race if the racing keeps going, I. I'm, definitely going to have him at a few of the races um, because he was, he was a big help and, and uh, the team liked him and everything. So um, yeah, it's nice to have some experience on your side. Now I got a question with your training and kind of up in the game. Obviously the bike is way different than you've, you know, than you've ridden in the past. Tires are different. What other training have you had to step up? Is there any kind of like motor skills kind of training instead of just the physical training, any kind of, I don't know, eye training, hand coordinate, well, anything that you've been working on that's a little bit different? No, I mean, the, the bikes aren't that different, honestly. They, they, they kind of went down two different uh, development paths. Um, so they kind of came to two different conclusions, but still those two conclusions are pretty close to each other. So um, there's just a few few minor things, but as far as changing up anything big, no. And and just just staying on a bike, staying, staying riding and doing things that help my confidence is the biggest thing i i mean because I've, I've always been a decently fit guy my dad was a bodybuilder back in the day uh and he took that mentality of 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 training your butt off and being disciplined and he put that right in into me when i first started racing and and so ever since i was you know 12 years old i was at the gym with my dad trying to work out trying to you know get the car to get the cardio up and and for racing and everything so i've always been a decently fit guy and I have never seen any results uh, improve because my fitness improved, honestly. Uh, the biggest improvements I've ever had in racing come from between the years. So, I mean, obviously there's some, I mean, if, you, if, if you're 30 pounds heavier than me, you're going to have a disadvantage that I'm not going to have. So, I mean, there's, you know, you got to keep everything in perspective. But, um, but for me, the biggest, the biggest things, the biggest thing that's ever helped me is just making sure I have uh, my, my head in check. And if I have my head in check, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm confident, and and uh, you know, I'm, I, I have my goal set, and I know what my end goal is, and I know where I want to go. I have my aim directed. Um, then, then I, so far, have been able to achieve things that I never thought were possible. So, that that's where the biggest difference for me comes in. So, my my training revolves around doing things that that keep me me confident and and keep my head in the game. Now. I keep on harping to keep on thinking tires, tires. I have no frame of reference to World Superbike tires, but you do. And what do you feel, you know, in your career, you've been on Dunlops. Was it like riding a different brand? Uh, did it help you get up to speed quicker uh, out there? Or, you know, tell me the pros and cons. Yeah, all right. I'll, I'll spell it out a little bit. They're, very, they're super different tires for sure. Um, the, the Dunlops, they seem like they kind of start here and they end – 
here. You know, it's like it's uh, you kind of start with maybe not as much grip as you would hope, but you don't end with less than you would hope. So it's that kind of compromise. Whereas the Pirelli seem like they start here with the amount of grip available, but then they end here. So it's like a way bigger extreme. And, uh, and that's, why, that's why I went from, from seventh place to uh, back to 14th by the end of the first race in Australia is, is because I, I just didn't manage the tires at all. And I, I literally, for the last five laps, had zero grip from the, from the left side of the tire, zero. I mean, I was almost crashing, turning into every left-hander on the track. And there's a lot of left-handers at that track um, because I just had no entry grip. I had no mid-corner grip. Um, and that was pretty eye-opening to, uh, to experience that. And it's, it's weird because I, I have done a lot of, you know, I've done, I've done the laps on the tires, just not all at one time. So that, that changes things a little bit. I mean, I've, I've done 30 laps on a rear tire multiple times, but just not at one go. And so that was, that was kind of uh, where I realized, like, all right, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to conserve the tire. And, and that's something I never really believed when people, when I hear the TV announcers and stuff say like, Oh, you know, he's, he's got to conserve the tire until the last part of the race. I was always like, I don't know what he's talking about. I've never had to do that. I've never had to conserve a tire. You know? and, and, uh, and now I fully understand that. So that's what I was excited to go into the race two with is that info. Like, all right, don't spin as much, uh, be more conservative. Um, you know, the hard part is doing that, being more conservative and, and not spinning so much, but then doing the same lap time. So, um, yeah, that's that's what I got to keep learning. Wow, that's that's got to that's got to make you really appreciate when you when you've watched these races, you know, the World Superbike races in the past, and you see, well, they're setting their fastest lap on like the second to last lap. You know, what were these guys doing for the other twenty laps? <laughs> you know, if they were just managing the tires, I mean, how does that feel? Yeah, I've actually done a quite a bit of research on it because uh, I mean, obviously, I want to know as much as possible mm -hmm. and they actually they they finished quite a, a few seconds off their their fastest lap they do in the first couple laps um most most of the time <clears throat> so that that is something in MotoGP it's different those guys are putting the fastest laps in at in, in the last part of the race um which is something that that we do here in Moto Americas mm -hmm. is uh you know just because the tires don't drop off that much so we're able to keep the pace going pretty well that was one of the things that when I, after the Laguna race, I looked at the World Superbike lap times and I looked at my lap times and compared them. And uh, they would get me the first like five laps. But then after that, I mean, honestly, it was the same for in the middle of the race. And then the last part of the race, I was gaining the same time that they had. I was gaining the time on them that they had gained on me in the, in the beginning of the race. So, and I'm talking, I'm not talking giant Jonathan Ray. I'm talking like, uh, you know, seventh place seventh place guy more or less and so it's just a different you get to, you get to the same end more or less it's just uh it's just how you get there so gotcha. but it, it definitely it's different to ride i mean i love hearing these stories have you had that kind of pinch me moment like wow this is happening what like what was that moment was it winning a championship here in the united states what was that moment you felt I i'm i'm i feel accomplishment i've kind of put in the work i'm here this is a good feeling. You know, what was that moment for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't really felt that at all doing this because I haven't done anything. I haven't achieved anything really. So, I mean, I, once I achieve something, I'll, I'll have a lot more. Uh, I'll, be, I'll have a lot more to be happy about. But, um, but for sure, winning the first championship in 16 on the Super, the super Sport Bike or Daytona Sport Bike back then, um, that was something that was, that was uh, huge for me. That was uh, something that I always knew I could do, but... You just, you always, you, th you think you can do it, but you don't fully believe it until you, it actually happens. And that was like a, a pinch me moment. And then the second time I did it, uh, it was really nice to back it up, but it wasn't necessarily a pinch me moment. It was just something that was like nice to carry, carry forward. And then, I mean, really the biggest one was, uh, was winning at Laguna kind of, kind of straight up. That was, that was something that, I mean, I used to race against Cameron back in the day uh, on the 600s and he was always kicking my butt every every weekend and i mean it was hard it was really tough because he was uh always you know seconds faster than me and i was on the same bike as him and and that's uh that's really hard when when you feel like you you can do the same thing that he's doing but you're just not doing it and you don't know why and that took that took a lot of a lot of confidence kind of away from me a little bit um and so 
they, I still will never forget. There was a, a race in 2013 at U, two races actually, but they were both at Utah uh, Motorsports Park. And in the second race, uh, race two, Utah Motorsports Park, 2013, I was I was leading Cameron going into the last lap, and I made a mistake uh, out of turn three, and and kind of almost high side a little bit, but not really. And he passed me back, and then I was never able to put a move on him. Uh, for, and I was never able to put a move on move on him after that. And he ended up winning the race, and and that was the last opportunity that I I got that that I had that year to try to beat him on the same bike and everything. And so like I lived for that forever, that <laughs> like for a long time. But like, dude, this guy got the better of me all year, and I never got I never got him back one time. And so from 2013 until you know uh, 2019, mid year 2019, I had that that just you know, just, I, I, I felt like I could, I could, I could beat him. I felt like I could beat Tony, but, um, it just, until you do it, you, you, you don't fully believe it. And so when I was able to do it the, the first time, uh, it just changes your perspective a little bit. And so, uh, so yeah, that was, that was cool. And, and, and to do it, 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 that's, that's why I was so pumped at Laguna is because I had spent seven years, you know, six years, uh, just, waiting for that day to have my chance to uh to, to to beat a guy like cameron and so to finally do it it was like man this is a relief like this is what i knew i could do the whole time actively no i was yeah 100 i was 100 i was actively pushing it just wasn't happening and that you know that's just the worst man is when it's like when you're given everything you have and you know you, you got your eyes open you're trying to learn as much as you can you're trying to take in as much information you you feel like you're taking all the right steps you're training hard you're eating right you're, you're light it's like it's like, trust me, I went down the list multiple times trying to make sure I covered everything. And uh, when it just doesn't come, it's you just want to bang your head against the wall. And that's what I did for a while uh, until it actually started changing. <laughs> so. That's crazy. You held on to that rage. I guess that just fueled the fire to get you to where you well, are. No, okay. It's not, not rage. It wasn't rage. It was just like disappointment in myself for not taking the advantage of the opportunity I had. And so I was just like, I carried that disappointment around for a while. Oh, not that it's that really sounds that sounds like rage. It sounds like rage. No, <laughs> and rage are different, man. Come on, don't make me. I wasn't angry at Cameron, not at all. It was just like I was just like, okay, like maybe a little bit mad at myself. All right, mad at myself. I'll go with that. <laughs> I will say this about you, Gary. You were probably one of the most humble guys in the world. I've you, you always find a way to make when when something I look at an athlete and go, God, that guy is pissed. I can look at you and I just know, yeah, he's mad. That's about what that's about what you would say is. I'm mildly upset by what happened. <laughs> the rest oh, of us would be pulling our hair out going, Dude. No, I mean, I'm pretty good at covering up. Uh, depending on the situation, I'm pretty good at covering up how I'm feeling on yeah. the inside. You know, you got to have kind of a poker face a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on that. <laughs> yeah, I think it was around 2018 into 2019. You just came back and you just seemed focused. You just seemed mellow. Nothing got to you. You know, you just seemed just to kind of – seem focused have your head down you know and that's the thing is i think i mean i'm sure you're aware of it I, a couple of years ago you know there was uh there was talk about putting some cameras on you and that's i, I want to actually roll that video footage uh, uh -oh. i will show you no it's all good it's nothing bad you warned garrett with all the stuff right oh <laughs> it's good it's good you know garrett talked about it yesterday before the race, he wants to show everyone that he's capable and he has gold. All eyes have to be on this young rider, Garrett Gerloff. It kind of goes back to uh, when I was four years old and I got my first ever motorcycle, which was a Yamaha PW50. And uh, just, just getting to ride that every weekend with my dad was kind of the only reason why I rode a motorcycle. And at first, I was so against road racing. I was like, no, I don't want to do it. Like, I'm about motocross, I'm a moto guy. Like, I'm out on road racing. It's kind of how it started. It just, just, uh, being against it and then just turned around and I started liking it and I was like all right dad sell my dirt bike like get rid of my dirt bike I want to I want to road race now and ever since then I just knew that I wanted a motorcycle to be in my life every day and and uh, what better way to do that than to just have it as your career that was a big switch for me going from uh, dirt to, to road racing I started taking it a lot more seriously uh, actually putting in effort and, and racing and I kept watching you know the AMA Moto America guys uh, on TV, I was just so immersed in, in road racing in general. I wanted I'd to study those guys and just see exactly what they were doing, and because I really wanted to be in, in this paddock, you know, I wanted to be a professional. And everything just kind of clicked, and I, I started riding a lot faster. 
the next year I moved up to a 600 when I was 14 years old and a lot of people said that was a little bit too early and that, that I shouldn't be doing it when I turned 16 on August 1st and that was uh, that was going to be my pro debut. I won my first ever pro race which was really cool. I had the fastest lap time and the track record. It's been a family effort ever since it started and, and uh, just awesome times with my parents and brother that I'm never going to uh, like forget about. You know, all of this is, is awesome and great, but I know it can be taken away from me at any time. The checkered flag and Derek Gerloff will take victory. He was pretty even killed back in the day, man. He was, he was just, you know, he had his eye on a prize and I knew there was a lot of attention that, that he was going to go places. And that's, that's what that was created. That was created for a, a, a actually a pitch for a pilot to put cameras on you because we all knew, and again, I'm not going to name certain names, but Corey and I, we, we definitely knew he's going somewhere. This kid's got talent. He's driven. And that's what it is. I'm, 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 I'm happy that that hopefully conveyed something to you that, you know, you, you came off uh, determined, you got good people in your corner and uh, you know, there, there, there's potential. Man, I appreciate it. No, that was cool watching that and just getting that flashback a little bit. Um, but I, I, I got to make one critique, and it's the way that video ended. Because I, I remember saying more. <laughs> I remember saying more, and I just don't like how it ended. Like, uh, I know this can be all taken away from you. It sounds like a really dark ending. Like, no, <laughs> what I was saying is that I, this can all be taken away from me at any point, which is true. And so I'm going to live it up as much as I can right now and, and give it everything I have because I don't want to wake up one day not being able to go back and change the effort I put in. <laughs> and so I, I know it can be taken away any moment, so that's why I'm going to give it everything I have now and have no regrets in the, in the future. See, so, he remembers. He remembers these interviews. It's great. <laughs> yeah. No, I now, remember, now, but... now, now, I want to really – now, where was that interview at? Where did that, uh, when did that take place? Uh, do you remember where uh, we, we recorded that interview? Yeah, for sure. Barber Motorsports Park, 2017. There it is. There it is. Oh, God. Come on, man. I'm on He's it. He's good. Trust He's me. good. And that's the thing is that no matter, clean. no matter what, he was always good on camera. And I got him sometimes at the worst of times, but he just, <laughs> composure, I just nailed it. Always, always good on camera. Now, I now, who, who helped you out with that, like, growing up? I mean, it's got to be your parents. I mean, your parents were definitely, definitely involved in your race program. Um, you know, who kind of gave you that ego boost that that confidence to you know go in front of a camera and speak and, and you know nail it every time no that, that's a that's a big life for, for real i am like the most introverted shy person in a normal situation like normal circumstances i i swear to you so i mean the the whole on camera thing it's just like I just, I, you go, you can go back and look at the first interviews that I did when I was 16 years old and I was a wreck. Like it was, it was not good at all. I've just gotten better over time, just practicing and, you know, trying to, trying to just uh, keep improving and stuff. But it's just all the stuff I've learned that's compounded over time and that's it. So, um, but I was going to say something else. See, look, see now you got too much pressure on me. You're like, Oh, he's saying he's good on camera. And I can't remember what I was going to say. Uh, Keep talking, Brian. Keep going. Uh, well, oh, I, I gotta, don't uh, give him that window. <laughs> <laughs> Just by being overseas, what have you seen that you'd like to see here? I'm not saying it needs help. I'm just saying if you had any suggestions. <laughs> as far as a championship goes, nothing. And Moto America is an awesome championship. They've been doing a lot of things right, 99% things right. Um, and, I mean, I, I am forever grateful for ha having them having given me the platform to, to build off to build my career off of you know what i'm saying so um as far as the championship goes not nothing in, in my view um the only i think it just starts with with just lifestyle it's it's those like that's the coolest thing that's that that has uh that i've seen being over there it's just like a motorcycle is everybody's first vehicle it's like everybody's first transportation i the little town that i live in as every 14 year old kid has uh a 125 like uh like a little yamaha mt 125 or you know, there's other other versions like uh, different from different manufacturers, but I've never seen. Uh, I don't see these kids walking around. They're just riding bikes. But I, it's just, it, you know, that that would be cool. I would really like to see that. I mean, like if I ever have a kid one day, uh, he turns 14, 15, whatever the, the the minimum age is to have a scooter. Like I'm giving I'm giving my kid a scooter, and he's gonna go rip it around and and just kind of experience the the bike life a little bit because I 
but it's it just here, you know, it's just you got to get a car and uh, it's the mindset, um, which yeah. I don't think is, is true at all. I actually, I have a, a Yamaha, uh, what do you call it? It's a T, not T-Max, uh, X-Max um, in the garage. And I ride that thing everywhere. I mean, I, I like I ride on the street and stuff. Uh, it's pretty usable, honestly. Like I got a box on the back and stuff and I put, uh, I put stuff, you know, I can, I can put groceries and things in it. Like it's got a bunch of storage under the seat. Uh, same thing fits two helmets like and then I just strap stuff to it like I, I like when I when I said I had my forks I had to go get them redone uh, I put the forks on the back of the scooter and I rode it to the, the shop to get them to get them redone and I mean yeah, but that that's just something that's normal that they do all that's just that's what they that's what they do in Europe and so I've tried to kind of like do the same thing here <laughs> and uh, yeah. and I think the more that the more that that kind of becomes the the mindset the more other people um we'll see it and then maybe follow the same steps. So, uh, so that's what, that's all I've been trying to do is like, uh, live what I preach. And if I'm always saying like, Oh man, you should go ride a, you should go ride a motorcycle and I'm not riding a motorcycle all the time. It's like, all right, well that guy's kind of a hypocrite. So, mm-hmm. so I've tried to like live the, live the, the message a little bit. And, uh, and it's been really cool. I mean, I've got a lot of positive response. I mean, I would say riding a scooter around maybe isn't the, the coolest thing to do, but uh, <laughs> but I've had so many people come up to me and be like, "Yo, what is this thing?" Like, uh, you know, and they they see me putting groceries and stuff in it, and they're like, "You can fit a whole uh, cart into that thing." I'm like, "Yeah, man, like check it out, you know, uh, you know, check out the website, you know, this thing goes 70, 80 miles an hour." Yeah, like I don't know, I try to I try to sell them on the idea of like uh, living with a motorcycle day in and day out, and and uh, and there's been a lot of people pretty receptive to it, so. Uh, it's kind of cool. I mean, is it going to change the world? No, but it's kind of nice just to see uh, see my my portion. My I'm trying to help things, so it's nice to yeah. see that kind of play out a little bit. But it seems like you're you know constantly a brand ambassador, not just for Yamaha, but just for motorcycles and just for the existence of it. Because I'm assuming you know motorcycle racing, motorcycles in general are a little bit more popular in your area than my area especially more probably prevalent in you know california and cory you know cory's area but is that what you get to you feel like you do you just kind of educating i just try to i just try to be like hey i really enjoy riding this thing around and i think you guys would too i mean i'm not going out there knocking on doors and ringing doorbells saying like hey have you guys seen this uh this motorcycle you guys might want to check it out but i, w- I would actually interest, i'm all in i'm like hey yeah dude i love this thing like blah 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 and uh because i think it's i think it is important i mean if people always talk about this is with anything people are always like oh yeah we want we want things to change and we want this to happen and this to happen but then they don't do anything about it and so i've just tried to be like all right well i want things to change so maybe i can be the catalyst to and see if things change because of me a little bit you know, there it is i i think if you had the approach like a jehovah witness and handed out pamphlets door to door i think that's where i, I think that's gonna work i mean gary i don't know, know, right. door. <laughs> I don't know about Come that on. i would answer the door i'd be like i'm curious what i mean i don't know about that approach like i said i think it's better for people to come to you and then uh <laughs> and, then, and then they're way more receptive to hear what you have to say like if you're just if you just you know banging on people's doors and saying well, like well, listen to me and what i have to say it's i mean well, not saying well it's nowadays you have to wear that. a mask and gloves and stand six feet apart so yeah, yeah. so that does, that, does that makes things that makes selling uh, the idea kind of harder a i think bit. what we're but, i think what we're learning here is that garrett's a much better scooter salesman than bobby fong ever was i would just say that if there's one thing i've learned in life it's that people will listen to you way more if you actually live out what you say uh, if, if you live out what you preach, you know, like that, if you do that, then people will be way more willing to listen to what you have to say. And then points get across a lot better. And so, um, yeah, I guess that's just kind of a, a top tip for the day. <laughs> so, so I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, again, we, we do have limited time. I know we both have other commitments and everything, but I want to, I want to ask this one question because I, I found out knowing you uh, for, for quite some time, religion does play a role in your life how important is religion in your life yeah for sure i, I mean I, i'm a christian and uh it is super important to me personally um i mean i'm always i'm not saying it would change but if, if i wasn't racing but for sure when i'm always putting my life on the line um it just makes you it makes you think more about what it makes you think more about things let me like if, if you're always staring death in the face it makes you wonder about death a little bit more and um and and for me uh i grew up in a christian home and and you know i wasn't always uh super you know receptive to the, to the idea of it 
Um, but the more I got into racing and the more that, like I said, um, I mean, I probably the, the biggest thing that happened to me is, is when I uh, broke my leg in, at Daytona. That was a, a pretty big moment in my life in a bad way, um, which really kind of opened my eyes. That was the first bone I ever broke. So that was kind of like my first uh, realization that, that pain was a, a lot, could be a lot worse. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I just, and I had a really rough, I had a really rough time for a while. Um, you know, just in, just in, uh, like just personal stuff that I was kind of dealing with and that, that didn't help any of that. And, and, um, I think, you know, we all have difficult moments in life and we all have, uh, have times when, uh, you just, just moments where you think about things. And, and for me, what, what, what clicked for me and what made the most sense to me, uh, and I've, I've done a lot of research, I've, I've watched a ton of different lectures uh i mean i mean i don't want to get into it too much but um but but for me what makes the most sense and something that i uh i can get behind is is the christian uh message and i think it's i think it's an overwhelmingly positive message um and uh i think there's i mean that's it's it's i don't think it's too debatable but the the western the whole western world was founded uh more or less on on the idea of of the individual having, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, like in the, in the constitution, it says that, that, uh, that we are made in the image of God and that's what gives us value. Yeah. I think that's something that's, that we should all hold on to whether we're religious or secular, because having, having the, the idea that the individual, um, is, is, uh, has value no matter what, that's something that is some, it's something that, if you know the guy you're looking at has has intrinsic value, intrinsic value. That's what I'm trying to say. Intrinsic intrinsic value. It uh it you know and and that you shouldn't kill him, for example, um or do other bad things to them. I mean, I think that's a pretty good message in general. So, um, uh, as far as the ethics go and stuff, I you know. I, I don't now know. I, now I no, but, no, but no, no, my question no, is is that you know got. I, I wasn't, a, and I hate to say as, as ignorant as it is, I didn't really open up my mind until I went overseas and got to see other religions, other faiths, other people. And it really just, if anything, I found this commonality. And that's what I'm kind of curious. Is it from traveling? Is it from motorsports that's kind of helped you out with your faith grow and understand and, you know, maybe appreciate, yeah. you know, the, the, the other religions and other things around you in your life? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I believe in the, the Christian message and, and I, I don't really 100% give credit to the, the other ones to the, to the same extent. Um, that's just my personal belief and opinion. Um, but uh, as the, the racing thing was a, a big thing for me. I mean, like I said, I, I mean, if you have, ex if, if anybody's experienced near death situations, uh, it changes your perspective a little bit and it makes you realize that, hey, um, life is life is short and it will end one day, no matter what, no matter how hard you try to, you know, eat organic food all the time and work out. Like, I mean, <laughs> your life is going to end. And so, um, I think, you know, people will try to not think about it and I don't, I don't see why that's a, you know, that's, that's a good plan for the most part because it's not fun to think about. But at the same time, I, I feel like just avoiding, it, it's something you got to look at. And I, I think everybody in their own time will, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you'll come to your, your own conclusions. Uh, and, and I came to mind and like I said, I've had some near death experiences, uh, and I'm constantly looking at it in the face. And so for me, I, I wanted to, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, let me, let me think about, let me think. For well, a no, bit. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt yeah. and I'm going to say this, uh, talk about near death experiences. I'm the opposite of a lucky rabbit's foot and i have to say i met you down at daytona broken leg uh i've worked with yamaha you've been injured a couple of times uh i think yes vir you were injured again there's a commonality is that i think i need to distance myself from you especially this year because <laughs> i think what it is the the the, the mark uh, what i'm leaving here is that i've always said hey good luck and I think I just need to talk to you after the races just so you can get the win and go, all right, good, you know, or change it up and say break a leg, <laughs> the exact opposite, because I feel 
I've, I've, I don't know. I might have, I might have made you more religious because of. My <laughs> so, no, I mean it is sorry, it's funny. So I've, had, I have had some some pretty bad luck and some bad experiences in my life, but I mean honestly, that those are that's when I've had the the most growth in my life is when really bad things happen to me, and so I like honestly just thank God for for having bad moments because it makes the good moments that much that much better, that much more worth living. And, um, and it's just kind of switching, switching gears a little bit, but, um, yeah, just, just like stuff like right now, uh, I haven't had like the perfect off, off season testing and stuff. And I haven't had the, the perfect first race, obviously, but you know, I, I try to embrace the tough times because for one, we're all going to face them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and two, if you got your eyes open and, and you're looking at the tough times as an opportunity to figure something out and to, to, to build your character a little bit and to, to learn something new that's going to further you farther down the road in your life. I mean, that, what better, what better lesson could you ask for? So I, I mean, I, I really, that, that kind of switched a little bit a few years ago, trying to look at things like that. But, um, but I, I see a huge uh, opportunity in self growth in, in tough times. And, and yeah, like I said, I try to embrace them and, and the, the most I've learned, the most I've ever improved, uh, whether it be racing or just, uh, as a person has been through just just gritting through you know the the tough times and and learning the lesson to be learned and and so that's something i would uh that's that's a perspective i would recommend people uh take on because it's helped me a lot he's got good parents i'm telling you i know no. <laughs> they raised him right i'm just i wish my kids grew up to be a garrett Gerloff. <laughs> oh yeah no it's so uh, good. Corey, you got anything? Come on, you. I, I've been stealing your thunder. Anything? No, man, it's good because you know what you just talked about you know, with your relationship with your faith and everything. That that's the second thing that you brought up about walking the walk, and you know when you talk the talk and walking the walk. Those are the two things. You know, it's that discipline, it's that focus that it's it's helped you through a lot of these tough times, and to bring people to your way of understanding things, you have to live it, and you've always lived that aspect of it and you've grown stronger as a result so by going through these difficult times and having those things to focus in on have um, clearly helped you out and you've kept your head straight so i applaud that man i appreciate it i just gotta add that i have not lived what i speak uh all the time so i'm not perfect at all i don't say that now i just just want to have that as a disclaimer (laughs) no no but you know nobody's perfect and then you know your your faith teaches you that and then you know you're sitting here talking to two probably the most imperfect people he's the real deal that's (laughs) that's why we got him on here so before we go, I promise, Corey, I got these graphics uh, that I got to show him. Um, oh, I got, I got to get his approval. Garrett, you can chime in too. So just, uh, just uh, bear with me here, and let's see. <laughs> do, do you like it, Corey? Or uh, we'll talk when the font gets bigger. All right, all right, all right, right stand by, stand by. Hold on, here we go, and Uh-oh, roll he's got it. Got it queued up. Yeah, there we go. Well, two stroke, right? I like the two stroke, two stroke sound. Thank, That's thank more you. appropriate. I, I thought of you, and I thought two stroke. He's a two stroke <laughs> man. Man, it's a light switch with me. That's the same thing as a two-stroke. I'm either happy or really mad. So it's good. <laughs> I, I, I said I wanted to do something for you. There it is. Thank you Corey very much. now committed to the show. He's a part of the show. He gets yeah. the but to do it. Last, it just didn't feel right last time, but now we got it, and now yeah. we're official like we're a good. goddamn referee with a whistle. But anyway, Garrett. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate. I hope you come back. I hope you're not scared. Yeah. You know. Now, lastly, the guys in those pictures right behind him. Have you talked to any of those? I know you talked to Josh, but I see. Was it Mike? Can, yeah, can man and. Who yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, try to stay in touch a little bit. Obviously, it's been tough because I've been all over the world, and uh, the T-Mobile SIM card is not always the the best uh, <laughs> SIM card to have on your phone in Europe, but. Uh, I've tried to stay in touch with these guys, and for sure, uh, yeah, we got these guys in the back. Uh, me, obviously, we got Steve-O, Josh, Vito, Mike Canfield, and Glenn. Uh, Glenn, Glenn was my crew chief last year, so uh, yeah, that I mean, that was that was the dream team until I went to the GRT team, and I think I got a new dream team, man. I mean, these, oh. these guys are a close. I mean, I'm not even gonna say second; they're like 
one point five, one point <laughs> one, something like it. They're almost they're almost on the same level, but the the new team I've been with, they've been. Now, now, real quick before you leave, did you brush up on any language overseas? I know your Spanish is pretty damn good. What else? Yeah, Spanish is is not too bad, but it's been suffering here because I've I've gone three months or something like that without speaking it. So when I try to go back and speak it, uh, it's it. it it's rusty <laughs> but um but yeah i try to learn a little bit of italian because my team's italian i just wanted to be a little bit more like uh nice if you try to meet them halfway a little bit mm -hmm. so uh so i try to learn some italian but it's too close to spanish so i end up starting a sentence the little i know in italian but then i just always revert back to spanish by the end of it and so they're like in this weird like language limbo of, of not knowing <laughs> uh, everything that I'm trying to get across and, and I, I got to work on it. But um, honestly, uh, Sol Alvarez, the, the, my, our team coordinator, she speaks five different languages, uh, mm -hmm. something like that. And she can bam, bam, bam. But like, it's, it's, it's crazy impressive for real. I hope she watches this so that she sees I shouted her out. But uh, like we were at, in France, 94, I think. And uh, she was speaking French to the waiter. She was speaking a little bit of Spanish to me. She was also speaking English to the, the Pata team, some of the guys that were there. And then she was speaking uh, Italian with the rest of the, the team. So, I mean, she was just bam, bam, bam between four, four languages and just buttery smooth, perfect, like pronunciation, all that, in my, my view. And uh, that stuff's so cool. Like, that's, I want to be able to keep going yeah. and learn more and stuff. Uh, I mean, that's, learning new stuff is awesome. It's because then you get to use it and then, then you feel like just that much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And that's the thing is I would love to see you uh, riding overseas. I'd love to be chanting. But I, again, if since I'm the jinx, I'll probably stay at least 500 yards away. But from the <laughs> sidelines, uh, either from my TV or from the track, be yelling, Histas Ugando. All right? Mm. Histas Ugando. <laughs> And you're Estás, like, what? Estás jugando. Now you're oh, playing. Oh, jugando. You're playing? What? Yes, yes. I've, I've been told by my Spanish friends that's what you yell. That's what you yell out of excitement. Now you're in the big leagues. Estás jugando. Now I probably look like an idiot saying this. Right? <laughs> but that's, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. That's my thing to you. Mucha suerte or suerte, which is like good luck. But Wait, do that like one more time, one more time <laughs> again? Suerte, suerte. Okay. Suerte. I'll just stand on the sidelines and just kind of go. Yes. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Garrett, listen, it's been a lot of fun. It's great catching up with you. Thank you again for coming on board. Hopefully you'll come back sometime soon. Like I said, we didn't scare away your sponsors or anybody, and hopefully you're in a good standing uh, with every, everybody after this interview. For sure, yeah, definitely. No, if anything, my, yeah. my view of you guys has improved slightly. So, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> slightly. <laughs> uh, everything good. Thanks, thanks, uh, yeah. thanks for having me on, and it was fun. You got it, guys. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Be good. All right. Thanks, Garrett. Be good, man. Take we'll care. See you guys.